Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 284 of Upgrade Podcast. Our today's guest is Mr. Chris Falkenberg. He's a concept designer at Blue Point Studio from Colorado, United States. And of course, you know, the links to his Instagram account and Art Session account are, you know, down in the caption down below. You can, you know, find them, find the rest of his stuff. And um, yeah, we're getting close to the 300 mark episode goal that uh, that we had for like 2024. So, you know, it's just like, you know, it's just around the corner, the episode 300, the end of season three. So leave any suggestions or anything you have for the next season down below as always, and I'll read them all. And with that being said, how are we doing today? Good, man. Thanks for having me. Um, excited to chat with you. Oh, <laughs> I've been watching a few of the episodes. So, um, oh, nice. Looking forward to it. All right. So let's start off with the first signature question of the pod- podcast, which is give us a little introduction on how we got into the world of visual arts and design. Basically tell us your origins or if you know, origin story of you know what led you to actually decide to become an artist for the rest of your life yeah so um i actually took kind of a backwards route to get here in university i actually studied business um which you know complete 180 (laughs) from art so um i was always an artist just like like a hobbyist um i like to draw since i was a kid and i was you know really into comics um i did take like some art classes as um, when I was a when I when I was younger as a kid, um, but more fine art related, and that to me never really clicked as something I wanted to do as a career, you know, um, like gallery art. And so, I think kind of when I discovered concept art, that was kind of like the natural path for me just because i was i I consumed a lot of entertainment and i was really interested in movies and games um um, tv shows so i think i think once i discovered hey there's you know an art related career that's not um fine art it's more entertainment related i think that was when i kind of knew you know this is this is something i want to do um and i kind of took the leap then and so i don't have any like formal art education i actually um learned everything I, I know about art and design and the classes I took were like a la carte classes from schools like brainstorm. Um, if you've heard of them, um, I don't have any like traditional art background. Um, so yeah, it <laughs> took me a bit to figure it out, but we got here. Awesome. And why business? Like what? like, how did that, you know, decision kind of went like, you know, like the, uh, you're yeah. not sure of, you know, choosing art, you know, because maybe, you weren't sure it's going to be a real thing. Maybe it was just instilled in your head that, Hey, I can, you know, have this on the side and, you know, take a safer route. You know, was it yeah, kind of- exactly that. So, I mean, it, it was just a safe choice. Um, you know, business is something that can apply to you know, any industry. Um, so I, it was something I didn't really know what I wanted to do um, for a career. And so that was kind of like a good, safe, all encompassing bet that it, it'll apply to a lot of things. Um, depending on what I want to do. And it applies to art too, you know, because a lot of the work we do is, um, you know, studio based, but also freelance based. And so a lot of business skills come into play um, when you're, when you're doing that kind of stuff. So just good skills to have overall. All right. And that's kind of interesting. You know, there's another thing I want to ask. Um, were there like, you know, any particular inspiration for you that, you know, kind of made you interested to, you know, get into entertainment art, you know, like, you know, production for, you know, entertainment industry, like maybe any particular video games or franchises that's really, you know, hit the spot for you? Yeah. I mean, Star Wars, I think is like the classic that everyone's going to say, um, but I like super into Star Wars. And then, um, I think the actual first introduction I had to like concept design specifically was through the FCD kind of, I think they're called design cinemas. It's their, they do like a free, um, they're like mini courses essentially on YouTube. I'm sure you're familiar with them, but that was kind of my first exposure to, Oh, you can do this stuff professionally. And I guess before that I hadn't really thought about, you know, all the designs you see in movies and in games and in TV shows, like there's someone that has to design those. Um, so I, I guess I was kind of like ignorant of that um, until I started kind of watching those videos and I was like, wow, this is, you know, really interesting stuff. Um, but in terms of like specific IPs or, um, or like games, I, 
I don't think there was anything that I was like one specific game that got me into it. It was just kind of like all encompassing, you know, um, I've always played games. I've always watched movies. And, um, so that kind of, that was kind of what led me down that path. And what were some of your favorite video games that really inspired you and you played the most actually? Yeah, I'm going to be, I'm going to be really basic. So the Witcher three is probably my favorite game of all time. Um, the final fantasy games. I, so I, <laughs> this is like blasphemy. I didn't play the original final fantasy seven, but I played the remake, um, which is really good. That's become one of my favorites. Um, all of the FromSoft games, I've always been really into like souls games as well. Um, if you made me pick, those are probably my tops, but, um, and then in terms of movies, yeah, like I said, star Wars, um, I think I've, uh, I have more broad interest in movies. Um, there's not like specific genres I'm like really into, but, um, you know, recently Dune has been really good. Um, yeah, man, I, I'm kind of, I'm not super picky. I like it all. All right. That's, a, that's an interesting range of things. Um, yeah. and speaking of actual final fantasy, do you think, you know, it's a good, good starting point, you know, for anyone for who's never, you know, gotten into any final fantasy games, like the remake one, because I've heard a lot of good stuff about it, but I don't know. Like, you know it's on my wish list on the scene, but I'm kind of doubtful if I should, you know, go for it or not. I thought it was, um, but I'm also not, I haven't played a lot of the older ones, so I know <laughs> a lot of people are going to disagree with me on that. Um, and I mean, I don't know. I, I haven't played them, so I can't really say, but I, I've, I doubt they hold up super well just because they are so old. So I think it's probably a fairly good entry. And from what I've read, I mean, it's pretty faithful to the originals, um, just a modern version. So I would say yes, but <laughs> someone's probably going to have words with me about that. <laughs> yeah. And well, um, that's Good, a good draft for as an introduction. And but the next thing I want to you know now discuss about and talk to you about is your main branch of design. Like in the introduction, I mentioned that you're a concept designer, and yeah. uh, but I want to know out of like all these positions that are available in the entertainment in the industry, what led you to become a concept designer? You know, like you know what? How was the path? So, all right. So here's the thing: from MBA to art, now from art, from fi- from like you know deciding between fine art and entertainment now entertainment now the next step is all right out of all these facets and you know pathways that are available to you what led you to become a concept designer more than anything and how has the journey of being a concept designer has been for you yeah so i think why i went with concept specifically is that uh, the, the most interesting part about it for me is like the actual generation and coming up with ideas um, on more of a macro scale um, in terms of like world building and, you know, blue sky explorations. That's just um, really interesting and really fun to me. Um, I do enjoy the technical side of things, but it's not what really gets me going, you know? So like the other kind of clear path, at least within games is like, Um, a 3d artist, you know, a 3d environment artist, a 3d character artist. Um, and I think, I mean, like that kind of work is incredible. You see it all the time. It's, um, really impressive what people are able to do, but it's definitely more of a technical focus. Right. Um, and I think the people who really enjoy that type of work are people who just, you know, love sculpting, um, love kind of the small technicalities of like making a really nice mesh and optimizing a mesh that can like work in engine, um, and really refining one specific thing. And I don't know that I have the, uh, the, I don't know if the right word is patience, but like just the attention span to spend, you know, so much time on one really, really refining one thing over months and months and months. You know, um, I, one thing I love about concept is that you can, you jump back and forth between so many different things and it's always something new. Um, and you're always coming up with new ideas. So, um, I actually, I I mean, I'd never really even considered any of the other art positions within entertainment. Um, they just weren't super interesting to me. Um, and I think also the 2d side of concept is another big draw, right? Um, I use a lot of 3d, especially in professional work, but it's, 
not usually the fun part for me. <laughs> like I like to, I like when you get it into Photoshop and you get to start painting or you get to start drawing. Um, and that's something that's fairly unique to concept, right? It's not really something you're doing as a 3d artist, um, at all. So, um, and then within concept specifically, um, the type of work I'm mainly doing is environment, um, world building keyframe type stuff. But, um, kind of one of my goals is to expand into more of like a generalist, um, someone who does a little bit of everything. So in my portfolio recently and in my personal work, um, that I've been doing, I'm trying to do more character work, more creature work, um, more specific hard surface stuff. Um, and just diversifying a little bit. Um, because like I said, there, there are so many things that concept gets to touch, um, (laughs) <laughs> that I don't really want to like limit myself or like pigeonhole myself into, you know, doing one thing, um, and one thing only. All right. Yeah. I mean, I kind of noticed that in your portfolio is like a nice, you know, vers- versatility between on the themes and genres of your works, like, you know, from fantasy to, um, like sci-fi to like, you know, yeah. just bouncing, you know, between different genres and, you know, subjects, you know, all the time, which is kind of interesting, you know, I've had an episode, I think it was episode 268 with Daniel McGarry. And his portfolio in terms of genre is kind of like similar to you, you know, it's, and we specifically talked that episode about like, you know, be like the advantages of being a generalist over like, you know, just laser focusing on like a certain yeah. genre. But like both of them have, you know, depending on the context, have their own benefits and, you know, um, there are pros and cons, but, you know, um, yeah. Throughout yeah, your I, I know Daniel. He's a <laughs> he's a good guy, and I, we definitely have similar approaches to uh, just art in general. And um, I think he's much more focused in t- when it comes to his portfolio and like what he wants to do than I am. I'm kind of like all over the place, not really knowing what the hell I'm doing at the time. But uh, yeah, there's definitely I mean, some similarities. I don't think there. it should be really weird. People can have multiple interests, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, that's that is something about me that I, I never had a specific, um, especially when it comes to genre interest, you know, there are a lot of people you see out there who, um, especially students who like want to target a specific studio or a specific IP they want to work on. And so they just do that work, um, you know, over and over and over again. And it's a good strategy, but, um, like I said, I, <laughs> I kind of don't have the attention span to just do one thing. So I've always been, um, bouncing back and forth, um, especially with like genre and subject matter. Oh, yeah, definitely. And speaking of, you know, just works in general in portfolio, how does your design process usually go anytime you want to start working on a new piece or a project? Basically, um, what does the structure of your pipeline look like, you know, both for personal work and professional work? You know, because I'm sure, you know, these two could differ in a lot of different ways. Yeah. So um, in general, my design process usually starts with writing. Um, I don't like just start sketching, drawing, painting, whatever, right out of the gate. Usually Um, I'm almost always starting with writing down um, either keywords or like just brief descriptions of what I'm seeing in my head when I'm like thinking of a design. Um, And then based off what I come up with in terms of like keywords and, uh, like key motifs that I want to hit in the design, then I'll start reference gathering. Um, and I'll try to find key references, specific references, um, that really describe, um, whatever word it is that I've chosen, whether, whether it's like a functional description or just like a feeling, um, I try to find as few references as possible that kind of get the point across. And then from there I start the actual, you know, like art process of um, whether it be sketches or if I jump straight into 3d or, you know, um, that kind of stuff kind of depends on the task. Um, And that's probably where my personal and professional kind of process differs the most is um, a lot of times on my personal work, I'll just jump straight into it and I'll just, uh, whether that be, or yeah, it's almost always a 3D base now. Um, I'll just start going. No sketching, no nothing. Um, just because 
it's, you know, it's personal work. It's meant to be fun. And I don't necessarily always want to spend, um, too much time really thinking through a design after I've been doing that all day for work. You know, it's, it's a bit lazy, but, um, a lot of the times that's where it's at (laughs) after, after a long day, you don't necessarily want to spend, you know, your free time working or you just want to have fun. So I, I kind of jump into the fun part. Um, and then for professional work, it's usually much more thought out. Um, so I'll do my reference gathering and, you know, jotting down and writing some of the keywords that I'm thinking of. Um, and then I'll usually start to refine the idea before jumping straight into like a finished image or finished 3d model, whatever, whatever the finished quality bar is going to be. Um, and that typically now for me involves a lot of back and forth with 3d. So I'll do like a very basic block in just primitive shapes and I'll just screenshot it straight out of a 3d program. Um, and then I'll draw over that in Photoshop and then I'll go back into 3d and I'll make some of those changes and then I'll screenshot it again. And then I'll draw over that in Photoshop. So it's a, it's a much slower, um, and, uh, more meticulous process for my professional work. Um, yeah. And, and my, and my process is always evolving. So, um, it changes, you know, you learn new techniques here and there, especially now with how much information is available, um, especially free information. It's just, you know, you're always picking up new stuff and always incorporating new uh, processes and techniques into your pipeline. So, you know, there was, there was this add on for, you know, 3D making 3D textures and, you know, tileables and stuff, you know, not tileables, but basically it, it's uh, there's an add on. I think it's called Expresso exporter or something like that, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that you can just quickly export a PNG to Adobe Substance Painter or Substance Designer, you know, to do your work. And I was wondering, like, you know, do you think, I, I think it should be, it can be done and I don't think it's that important, but, you know, I, whenever I ask this question about pipeline, I'm always like, you know, thinking about, you know, how can this pipeline become more efficient and faster? And now, you know, in your case, I'm like, would it be like kind of interesting if there was like <clears throat> add-on for Photoshop or Blender that could link together and just with press of a button or a shortcut, just whatever is on the view part, you know, uh, like, you know, point of view that quickly can be added as a PNG layer to your Photoshop. Like, do you think something like that could really help or it doesn't matter? It's just a alt tab and that's it. I mean, it, I'm sure it could help um, some people, but for me, stuff like that isn't really important because I'm never going to show this part of the work you know, it's meant to be really rough and really quick. And so just a screenshot and alt tab, I mean, it's almost instant for me. Um, and the quality itself doesn't really matter because nobody's ever going to see it. Um, but I could see it being useful, you know, um, just, just to have, I mean, that sounds nice. Like click one button and then it appears. Yeah. Um, I mean, I know what I said was really, really simple, but you know, but well, what about you? Like, you know, what do you think, you know, could really help you like benefit you in your workflow? Like what type, what type of like feature would really help you? Um, you know, that's a good question. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of an add on junkie. So I have an unbelievable amount of add ons in blender and it's, it's stuff that I never use. <laughs> I like download it. I use it once. And then I never touch it again and it just clogs on my blender and like all my coworkers, um, you know, like give me crap for it. But, um, I don't know that this is kind of going to be maybe not the answer you're looking for, but for me personally, I don't know that an add on or, you know, an addition to any software is necessarily going to make me more efficient. I think it might be trimming down actually is the solution for me. So deleting a lot of stuff and simplifying, um, I think actually would be what helps me the most. Um, yeah, I'll have to think a little bit more about that though, because that's a good question and probably something I should consider more, but, um, there's nothing off the top of my head that I'm like, you know, I need this feature. I need this to, uh, really make me more efficient and help my workflow. It's, it's more about, um, what can I cut out? Um, like what fat can I trim from the process? Oh yeah, definitely. And, um, like, 
I don't know. I'm not a, like a 2D concept artist or anything like that, but I'm I'm just still trying to think. You know what what can be what can really help when it comes to like you know connecting software together. You know. Yeah. Like for yeah, there's. Um, I mean, the more connected software is in general, the better, in my opinion. And I like I'm someone who tries to keep as few different softwares. Um, in my process as possible, just because I personally don't like jumping between, you know, five different programs to uh, kind of achieve a finished image or visualization. Um, but the softwares I do use, which right now are mainly Blender, Photoshop, and ZBrush are very well connected. Um, there's an add-on called GoB, which works with the ZBrush native GoZ exporter. So it's like a one-click export from ZBrush. Um, and to and from Blender. So you can like block something out in Blender, send it to ZBrush with one click and then send it back with another um, super, super efficient. And then Photoshop, obviously just Photoshop works with everything. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And um, now here's an, like another question that I want to you know, ask as an extension to this subject. Now, do you work in, in, in office studio or do you work like, you know, from home with the studio you're I'm working? fully remote. Fully oh, remote. fully remote, right. But have you had the yeah. experience with, you know, being, you know, on site as well? No. So I've actually never worked in person, <laughs> which That's is, uh, yeah, it is interesting. And it, I think it presents a lot of challenges, but also a lot of benefits. Um, you know, as with anything and it's, for me, I like it. Um, you do miss out on some of the like interpersonal aspects of like working with people in person and, you know, you bump into someone when you're walking to get water and then that leads to a chat and then, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, but, and, and that is something that like is definitely missed working remotely, but I think the benefits, at least for me personally outweigh, um, kind of the costs it's you know you don't have to move for one which is a huge plus um and then for two you know <laughs> like i've got a kitchen right there and i can just make myself lunch you know i don't have to go out to eat every single day or i don't have to like plan ahead and it, there's just a lot of convenience that comes with um remote work so it's yeah, not something i personally mind yeah, that's interesting, you know, that like this topic has also been really interesting to me to talk about with guests. Um, but have you ever, you know, wondered or had the itch to want to actually try being in a, like a, like those oh. high end, like, you know, AAA companies, you know, the studios where, you know, everyone is just, you know, working together, having fun together, crunching together. Like, it's just like a whole camaraderie to it, you know, and it's a different yeah. feeling and ex experience. Like I like, you know, personally, like, like I'm. I'm a junior artist, so I'm just building on my portfolio. I haven't had an experience in the industry, but I definitely, you know, yeah. I can understand the benefits and convenience of like you know, being remote at your at the comfort of your own home. That you can just, you know, wear a pajama and you know, just work all the way, you know, out of your comfort, <laughs> your home, everything as you said, yeah, you know, with all the benefits. <laughs> exactly. But at the same time, I really want like experience, you know, that's why I've been feeling of being in a good team, you know, where everyone is just, yeah. you know, vibing well. It's, and by big team, I don't necessarily mean the a high intensity environment. I mean, I mean yeah. working something together, physically being in close proximity, because in for me psychologically, I need that too. You know, I can't just sit yeah. at home and do it. Like, listen, it's awesome that you can do everything right now online from home, everything. But at the same time, I really crave that kind of camaraderie and just having yeah. people around me that, you know, I'm working with, I get good energy from, I give good energy to them, they give good energy to me. That sort of thing, I think really um, affects even the quality of work that to some extent, I would even argue that, you know? Um, yeah. But, um, but what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. And I think... Like that is the big thing you miss out on working remotely. Um, the so for me personally, with my current the studio I'm at, at, I feel I still get a lot of that collaborative feel of like working with people constantly and talking with people constantly and kind of bouncing ideas back and forth and collaborating. Um, and that I think is just a result of how they've kind of structured 
their work from home. So like everything is very connected. Um, you know, all the software we use is like very open. You can see what everyone's saying. You can, you know, get in touch with people instantly. You can jump into chat rooms with people, um, like no problem. So that kind of like collaborative atmosphere still exists for me. Um, and I know it differ- it's going to differ from studio to studio, you know, it's completely dependent on how, how they're set up and you know, how, how they actually work. Um, but I do like, I totally agree with you. And I do think that there's a, a certain aspect to like being physically with people, um, and like picking up on that kind of energy that, that you completely miss out on, um, working from home. So yeah, I mean, it's totally understandable. And I think that it's, it's not really an experience that I'm like dying to have, you know? Um, but if it, if it were like available, I would do it. Um, it's just not something I would be like, it's not like a make or break for me for any job, you know? Well, right now I can understand that, you know, because you have a lot of time and opportunity in the future, you know, on your hand that you can definitely, you know, try that. But yeah, like, Life is too short to just stay at home, honestly. Yeah, That's yeah. a message to everyone, you know? And yeah, you make a good point, especially for, uh, I mean, like people in general are just so sedentary now. Um, oh, yeah. That, the postures yeah. are all shrink <laughs> like, like, all right, posture, take it one, right? <laughs> fix your posture. Yep. <laughs> Dude, the, the best investment you can make is a, a nice chair. Ergonomic <laughs> doing anything, chairs, right? Yeah. That was and like my thing, first big purchase and I like zero regrets. <laughs> yeah, that's very important. Actually, I've been living without a chair for the past four years. So it, this is just, I'm living in a small studio apartment. So you have to be creative with your space. So this is yeah. just my bed and the place where I work, the place where I sometimes eat and that's it. Mm-hmm. So I always have to fix my posture, but most of the time I, I'm like slouched. So yeah, definitely, yeah. you know, like taking like this is small stuff that, you know, uh, you might not, you know, really consider them to be important, but in the long term, they will, you know, add up, and you know, uh, you will see the consequences of those habits in the long, long run. You know, like for example, yeah. for me, like I know soon, and the reason I haven't gotten a chair yet, for example, recently, is because I know I'm gonna move out soon, so you know, it's for my next yeah. place. Um, but yeah, that's like yes. something that you <laughs> definitely, definitely stuff you pay for down the line. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely, definitely. And um, so here's another thing that I want to ask you is who are some of your favorite artists and designers that have inspired you the most? Uh, You know, I've got a lot. So one of my biggest, and I'm sure a lot of people say this is Jama. Um, And the reason, I mean, his art is incredible, but it's not the main reason of why he's like super inspirational to me. The main reason is how kind of innovative he is in terms of um, his processes and his techniques and just this, some of the, the stuff he's developed in the ways of working and the ways of thinking um, and, you know, tools for efficiency. It's really interesting. Um, and he's <laughs> like, he's always coming up with these different ways to do things that are, um, that I, I mean, I would never think of. So it's like, for me, it's, it's really inspirational to see a lot of that stuff. Um, and then of course, like you got Jamie Jones, Craig Mullins, all the greats. Um, John Park was always a really big inspiration for me because of, um, I, I, I know he does a lot of like the super painty stuff now, but actually some of the first concept art I was concept art education I was exposed to was, um, these really old John Park recordings from a place called red engine, which was, kind of like a, a, a concept art trade school. Um, I think it's been shut down forever now, but he used to teach there. And I, I found these recordings of him doing like neck designs and just ballpoint pen. Uh, <laughs> and it, it's like unreal. I mean, he's, he's banging these things out in like an hour and it's like, it's just crazy to watch. Um, and those were some of the first like actual concept art, I guess, tutorials you'd call them that I saw. And that, you know, they're really old, but um it was always just super inspirational to me. And I, I like went out and bought a sketchbook right after that. And I was like, I'm going to do that. And then I tried and I was like, good Lord, I'm never going to be able to do this. So, <laughs> um, yeah, James pack is another big one for me. Um, and he, I was actually, um, I got to work a little bit with him and his team, which was a cool experience. Um, and a lot of his old, uh, 
concepts are like some of the first exposure again that I had to the industry. So, um, yeah, Richard Anderson, another really good one. Um, I think you've interviewed him actually, but we had recently, I, I think it was a 276, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just amazing, amazing stuff. <laughs> his illustrations, his sketches, everything is just so good. Um, yeah, man. I mean, there's really too many to list. It's pretty much everyone <laughs> inspires me in some way or another. So, all right, fair enough. Yeah. And there's a couple of things I need to ask you right now. Um, the first thing is, is there's kind of like quick round questions. Don't worry. Um, do you know what comes up when you search on Google Chris Falkenberg? Um, I do know this actually. So it's an FBI agent, right? No, is he? No. There's this, there was I'm this guy, sure. Christopher Falkenberg. It's a security expert and founder and president of, like, you know, inside security and risk management firm. Okay, yeah, that's Ooh, who I'm wait. thinking about. <laughs> Former special agent, actually, you're right. Yeah, yeah. I don't actually, <laughs> it sounds like super uh, egotistical that I know that, but yeah, I have Googled myself. <laughs> and, like, I mean, we all do, you know, because we want to see what results, what links pop up, you know? Yeah. Sometimes I, I did Google myself like, you know, a couple of years ago and I found a blog post I was in like when I was 10, 11. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, it was like digging like ancient like history for me at the time, you know, when I saw that. Like things from 2007, 8. Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah, it's it's crazy, man. Like everything online is just archived. <laughs> you go back and see some of the stuff you did when you were younger. It's like, yeah, there's also this website damn. called Wayback Machine, I think, that, you know, it archives like literally everything on the internet. Yeah. And yeah, yeah it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, there's uh, definitely some embarrassing photos of me up there somewhere. Oh, we all kid. have them. No, don't <laughs> listen. Cringe is a constant of life. Honestly, you know, yeah, we're, we're all to some extent cringe, you know. But the ratio just changes, you know, as we move along and get more self awareness over it. Yeah, so we can hide it yes, better. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, man, and um. You know what? What I was, what I saw this video like a couple of months ago about like digital archaeology, and it was really interesting. I think it was a thirty, like it was a huge video essay, and it was going through like you know there was this group of people dedicated to finding like you know um, the texture files of like old Nintendo games, mm-hmm. and they dug and dug and dug, and they found this like you know texture CDs from Japan, which was which wasn't for sale. It was just internally for, you know, people, video game companies in Japan that they had them, like, you know, all the textures, for example, in the Mario, the 3D Mario 64, the, the, the first, I think, 3D Mario game was from that yeah. CD. A lot of, like, majority of the games from at that time was just from that CD. And, you know, wow. and, I, and I like it when people, you know, get, you know, nerdy about it and trying to pinpoint and do investigation work to find the source of, like, something like that. Yeah. And, this, and, I, and it reminded me of this because of the way bag machine thing we just mentioned. Like if you, yeah. like a lot of the artists that, you know, I sometimes, you know, I, like there are some, I don't have any names in my head right now, but there are a group of artists, you know, that I, they're all, they're a little bit, you know, compared to us are all timers, like from like, they were active in nineties, you know, early two thousands and you can't, mm-hmm. you know, find, you know, anything on them. They have no social media. So sometimes mm-hmm. you actually have to dig to find a contact, you know, outlet for them. And one yeah. time I, and, and, and one time I did, and I found someone's email and I was really proud of myself because I dug and dug and I found this blog post from like 2004. <laughs> yeah. And there was an email there and I was like, the guy hid everything, but I found this here. It's just like finding a treasure in like a room or something in an RPG game. Yeah. And yeah. But I mean, I really recommend everyone to start thinking about like, for example, if you're into art, start thinking of old concept arts of video games that you no know, people didn't use to post a concept art on like social media. There was no social media. What would they do? Would, how were they like the quality of it? Like, if you're geeky about this stuff, you can find really cool, interesting stuff. I know it sounds actually, I know it's just like 20 years ago or something, but it feels like ancient history. You know? Yeah. And yeah. I really recommend everyone, you know, to go check this stuff out. Uh, yeah. And like that old stuff is really, that's like the gold mine of information because it, there was such a high bar, a high barrier of entry technically to do that concept art back then, you know, now we have like 3d and all these tools that, um, definitely make the job easier. I mean, um, not that it's 
an easy job. <laughs> they, they do make it easier. And so a lot of that really old stuff without any of the more advanced tools or um, kind of like tricks that we have now, it's, you, you can really dissect them and figure out um, just how incredibly strong foundationally <laughs> some of those like really old school concept artists are. Um, it's cool to look at. Yeah, definitely. And um, what was I going to say? I was just, had just something in my mind to mention about this stuff as well. Um, oh yeah, I remember there was this there was this guy who his whole YouTube channel is about digging up you know the first early versions of sub famous softwares like. The guy tried to make like a Sonic head in the first version of Blender, and it was so weird seeing the first version of Blender. <laughs> it was the nineties. Yeah. You know? Did did uh, sorry for asking, but you know what year were you born? I was born in ninety eight, so I'm uh, twenty five. Oh, ninety seven. Pretty close. Okay. Um, yeah. So here's the thing, Blender. I think you know, if I'm not mistaken, was you know released in nineteen ninety four. When was the first version of? Blender got released. 1994, Jesus. Wow. January 2nd. Hit the nail on the head. <laughs> yeah, pretty much 1994. And it's so weird to think, you know, oh, we, we weren't even born when Blender was around and we're just, you know, using it all the time. Yeah. And I mean, Blender is really an incredible software. I mean, it's free, which is crazy for how much it can do and how powerful it is. And then just you know, all the benefits that come with it being open source. It's, it's definitely like game changing. I mean, and you can see just based on how many people use it now versus some of the older uh, 3d packages. I mean, it's, it's completely dominating the space. So really, really yeah. cool software. And um, what are you working on right now that you can tell us about? What kind of project is it? I mean, of course, you know, if, and if any NDA stuff is involved, we can, of course, you know, you don't have to answer this. But, you know, let's say in terms of like, you know, per- personal work, you know, what, what are you doing right now? Yeah. Um, so all, like all my professional work, I can't talk about, unfortunately. I wish I could. <laughs> going to be a bit of time. But personally, um, kind of like I had said earlier when we were chatting is um, – I'm doing a lot of like quicker projects right now, just playing around with like different subject matter than what I usually do. Um, like characters, creatures, um, and really trying to experiment and mess around with both my design process, but also, um, my just like image creation process, um, and trying to figure out, this is something that's kind of like a constant thing for me is I'm always trying to figure out things I can tweak. Um, and where can I find different efficiencies and like, how can I make the process more fun um, is a big thing for me because I mean, ultimately the reason why I'm doing this professionally is because I enjoy it. Um, it's like fun for me to do. And so, <laughs> so if I ever get to a point and I, I have done this occasionally where it's like, I've adopted some new process, which is like really not fun for me. And then it starts to become work again. Um, I try to get out of that as quickly as I can. Um, and so, personal work is kind of like where I make a lot of those discoveries just about like my own way of working and, and like what I want to tweak and what I want to change and that kind of stuff. Um, so in terms of like actual personal work, I'm not currently doing like some big overarching prop uh, project. Um, it's mainly smaller stuff and just kind of fiddling around with my process. But um I have been planning on doing a larger scale personal project just because um, it's, I kind of like go through waves and I think it's a good thing to just kind of like keep you interested, but I go through waves of doing like actual projects that I'm going to work on for like a month or two and then just doing like daily sketches and then going back to a project that's a little bit longer term. Um, So I'm kind of thinking about right now what I want to do for a longer term project in the near future. Um, And so I'm kind of like starting that process of what we had talked about at the start of just thinking kind of like very broad, high level what I want to do um, and starting to think about like what words can I associate with whatever world or whatever designs I'm trying to do. And then from there, I'll start um, gathering more specific references and kind of building it out. But um, that's kind of like on the books for me in the near future. But currently, it's, it's a lot of the quicker stuff. Um, 
and just a lot of experimentation. All right. And there's another thing I need to ask you as well. What is the story behind your profile picture that's, you know, the, like the guy with the helmet and the space suit? <laughs> Who is that? Like, tell us, tell us the details. You, there, there is no like profound story to go with that. It's just, um, uh, you know, Satish Kumar. I'm sure um, you've oh, heard yeah. of him. He, yeah. So I, I don't remember when I heard him say this, but he was he was talking about how because he has like a little pixel guy as his avatar for everything, and he was talking about how everyone recognizes him because his profile is the same on everything, and he never changes it. And I was like, I want to do that. <laughs> So it was just like some random sketch and I was like, I guess this is it. And then I really should change it. <laughs> I, I just never got around to it. And so, um, that became my little online avatar, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I have, I, mean, I have actually been meaning to, uh, do a new one a little more up to date. Yeah. But the thing is the good thing about like having like an avatar like that is it kind of sets your identity and brand to an extent. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and, and, and kind of like I was saying, if you keep the same picture across every social media or whatever you're on, then it's like you're easily recognizable. Um, exactly what you were saying. But oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah my, my Spaceman brand kind of was born out of just a random doodle. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything, really. Yeah. And by the way, like, you know, there's another thing I want to mention that that Chris Falkenberg, the special agent dude, is not the only every Chris Falkenberg that popped up. There was another a drummer, Chris Falkenberg. Uh, oh, yeah? As well. And there was, I think, a Norwegian guy, Christopher Tjornild Falkenberg. Interesting. <laughs> Have Popular you done one of those, you know, DNA testing that tells you, like, you know, a percentage of your ancestry <laughs> and stuff like that? No, I haven't. Um... I don't really plan on it, but it would be interesting to see. Um, I'm actually, so I'm half Chinese. I don't, I don't think I mentioned really? that. I don't know why I would have. Yeah. I don't look at it at all, but my mom is from Hong Kong. Um, Dude, your dad's genes then, took over completely. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yes. It's interesting. Huh? Nobody believes me when I tell them that, but um, yeah. So I, I know that side of my like kind of genetics, but um, my dad is just kind of like a mix hodgepodge of European. So, um, I think dominant in his family is maybe Irish, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, yeah, I really have no clue. All right. That, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. There was Very, this yeah. guy, I, I was playing lethal company with, and he said, Oh, I'm actually like, um, we're just all saying, you know, where we're from and everything like that in a party member. Have you played Little Company, by the way? Yeah, dude, You're that amazing. game is so fun. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I, I hope it gets updated because I want to get back to it soon again. Um, yep. but the thing is, you know, the guy was saying, Oh, I'm actually like, you know, Chinese, part Chinese, part Jamaican, part British. And I was like, This guy is just trolling. And he sent his Instagram and I was like, Wait, yeah, is it actually right? It was, <laughs> it was like an interesting mix of all of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny, man. It's uh <laughs> it's really hard to tell some people. I mean, like it's it's just like the weird genetics thing. Like sometimes you could be like one quarter Spanish and just look like you're Spanish, or you could look nothing like it, you know, it's it's really funny. Um <laughs> that stuff yeah, works. Definitely. And um <clears throat> Yeah, so we're right now with the Chris Falkenberg variant, our like concept designer right now in the podcast. The other Chris Falkenbergs are doing other stuff <laughs> in the other timelines. Yeah, the other multiverse Chris Falkenbergs. <laughs> yeah, and uh, all right. So, uh, what area, based on the area you're working on right now, would you be interested to explore and learn in the future? Like, basically, what I'm asking is, what other non art related stuff you got going on in your life? Um. Yeah, I mean, so living in Colorado, we've got the Rocky Mountains here, um, which you know, presents a lot of opportunity to do fun stuff. So um, we get to do a lot of hiking, a lot of we have a lot really, really good skiing here um, in the winter, which I've been I'm excited that summer's come Man, it was kind of a shitty winter, but um, it's like a big thing in the winter. And then um, Besides that, just kind of like getting out there and living life, you know, um, 
I think there is, you can easily fall into the like trap of doing art all the time. Um, which is kind of <laughs> like we talked about earlier. You don't want to be like the hunched over shrimpy hermit, you know, um, that doesn't do anything else and never leaves. So, um, just like uh, paying attention to other aspects of life, you know, friends, family, and that kind of stuff is all really high on my priority list. Um, I was getting into model making for a while. What type which of model? I, uh, like Gundams, if you know those. Oh, that's yeah, sort I was of model getting making. super, super into that for a while. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of fallen off for me, but um, maybe I'll get back into that at some point and then. Yeah, man. Besides that, playing some games, catching up on movies. Um, been reading a lot of books this year. I'm trying to hit 30, which will be the most I've ever read. So don't know if we'll get there. <laughs> we'll see. That's um, awesome. Yeah, speaking of books, like I don't know about storybooks, but about educational books right now. Like, you know, I I could argue that you don't necessarily need to read educational books that much because all the same info, yeah. could, you know, someone could explain it in a YouTube video essay or – you could just copy paste a whole transcript of that book and to ChatGPT and tell me, hey, summarize yeah. me the most important points. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I definitely think it's not the most effective or efficient way of learning it oh, yeah, anymore. Definitely. Yeah. So, idea. yeah. Um, and I mean, dude, like, especially like college textbooks, which I'll never have to buy again, but I mean, most things are so expensive and there's so much information online for free now. It's, it's crazy. Um, so yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I, I feel like you don't need them really. Um, and I, I don't read educational books. I read like a lot of fiction. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it's interesting. It's interesting for sure. Yeah. Cause I think it was, it was actually in your podcast with, um, I think with Richard Anderson where he was talking about like how he had to buy a book on like 3ds max and like read through the freaking manual. And uh, dude, I can't even imagine like (laughs) that would be so, so tough. So painstaking. Yeah. Like yeah. people used to do that. Like for example, if you wanted to become a program, you, if you wanted to become a basic like programmer and make a little, your own website in PHP or you know, I don't know, like you know stuff like that for the backend stuff, you had to actually buy books with that come with you know these instructional CDs and the in the yeah. files of IDEs and everything, and you have to go through it step by step and test it. And <laughs> yeah, 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 it's yeah. crazy, man. It's a uh... And speaking of like education, that's like one of the cool things about our industry is you don't need like a, a formal education to get in. But that's also something that like we're kind of seeing in under, other industries as well. Um, and, and I'm just bringing this up because you reminded me of it talking about like coding. But there's like a lot of software jobs now that you don't need a degree for. I mean, people just go to like an online boot camp and then <laughs> jump straight because into at the it. End of so. the day, can you be a useful yeah. person in the pipeline? That's yeah, it. Exactly. It's like, do you have the skills? Um, the piece of paper doesn't matter as much anymore, which is, it's a good thing for sure. So. Honestly, it's amazing. But the yeah. really weird thing is, for example, I, for example, I'm, I'm an Iranian citizen right now. I have an Iranian passport. So if I want to apply for a work somewhere, like in, let's say, Europe or North America, I have to, you know, first get approved by the studio or company, which let's yeah. say they do, but the, here's the actual hurdle. I don't have a bachelor's, all right, at all. Mm-hmm. So they just see, Oh, this guy doesn't have a bachelor's. Why? Well, I already got an approval from the company. Why not give me the visa? No, 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 no. You need to have a, like a bachelor's related to your, you know, a job that you're yeah. applying. And that's why I actually applied for like a creative media game technologies bachelor in Netherlands. And hopefully in a couple of months, I'll start. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, stuff like this really sucks, you know, for when you want to immigrate, like, you know, because yeah. like, I think uh, Richard Anderson actually told me uh the thing about uh, Jama Jamal, I think he told me that he actually initially studied aerospace engineering, I think. And I was like, what the fuck? And <laughs> yeah. uh, basically, yeah. he had a lot of problem getting his visa and stuff like that. Or there was another case. Oh, Marby. Marby, <laughs> Marby Kwong. She was also on the podcast. He, she used to work on in Blizzard. But now she's, I think she recently tweeted she's in Monomy Park right now. Con- congratulations to her, by the way. Um, but the, but actually, she told me this as well. She is a citizen of UK, right? She, yeah. I think she was born in Razor, I think she told me. And she had problems as a UK citizen to get into US for work visa. Mm-hmm. Imagine that. 
Yeah. And she didn't have a bachelor's. And she told me the best way in order to increase your chances is just be active as much as possible. Be go give seminars, you know, try to win awards in art station or anything, you know, just get your name out there. So when they f- background search you, they'll see, oh, this guy's activist, not just some random guy with a made up portfolio. And we don't know if he's done it or not. And, you know, stuff like yeah. that. So, yeah, that's the uh, thing about just ask the companies might will give you the job but sometimes you know if you if you're in the case of immigration it might be a little annoying not a little a lot actually yeah yeah that's when like formal education really comes into place with like the work visas exactly like you said it's just it's i mean i think in some countries you, you literally can't get one if you don't have a degree which is you know it makes everything yep. a lot tougher um japan is like that germany is like that the us is like that like you, you have the yep. bachelor's related to the job you're applying to but it's very yep. weirder like for example yeah. you studied business imagine imagine you're a uk citizen and you studied business but now we got the job yeah. as <laughs> just screwed. and you yeah. want to relocate it, we're like, <laughs> what the what the hell he's he, he's a bachelor in business what does it have to do with his job this smells fishy denied yeah Exactly. And it's, I mean, it, it's really tough because even getting a company to sponsor you in the first place is like hard enough. And then, you know, that's just like another whole hurdle you have to deal with. So definitely yeah, really, really yeah, tricky definitely. sometimes. But please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, you know, uh, if you actually, if someone who wants to get into the industry, and of course, you know, right now, and it, it might sound weird because right now everything is so tumultuous and, you know, chaotic, but I think the with a little bit of like planning and strategizing, you can definitely you know, shine out, you know, from your, the rest of your peers and competition, I think, you know, because um, yeah. I'm seeing like people you know, on Discord servers and stuff like that, even myself, like, you know, we, uh, I don't see that many people being super hardcore about their portfolio and everything. Like a lot of people were putting in effort and energy, don't get me wrong, but I don't yeah. see there's only a very limited amount of people who are like super nerdy and weird and obsessive about their portfolio and fork flows. And those are the ones who yeah. usually have, get the job first, you know? And I mean, yeah, depends yeah, on yeah. And everything, but I'm saying that with just a little bit of hard, hard work, you can definitely get it done. I know it sounds really boomerish of me to say this, but it's, <laughs> I think it's true. But this is no, why I'm telling you, so correct me if I'm wrong, you know? Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's, I mean, it's all about hard work because every other portfolio getting submitted is your competition, right? And so um, you have to work really hard to make yours stand out because otherwise it's just going to like fall into the shuffle of things. But um, yeah, I, I do agree with you that there, like, there's a lot of really, really good work out there, but there's still a lot of ways for you to differentiate yourself um, and like really put your personal taste out there and your personal perspective on things. And I think that's what a lot of um, people who are in positions to hire really gravitate towards is that if you have a unique perspective and a unique approach to things um, like your work is going to way out shine generic spaceship number 200 you know that they've seen that week so um just putting like your own personal flair on things like goes a really long way in my opinion um into like making your portfolio shine and and kind of stand out from the rest i mean (laughs) there's no shortage of generic stuff out there you know really really high quality beautiful work but like the same idea being presented just in a different way for the however many times um yeah actually, and, and that's not to say that i don't do that like i'm a i'm a big culprit of doing stuff like generic stuff but well um, i mean here's the thing we can't yeah. all be original and unique from the get-go i mean we have to you know get yeah. get with those stuff you know to get the pipeline and you know workflow done then yeah sure then comes yeah. the time for you know like putting your own taste and expressions you know to your work so you know that's normal uh but it's kind of like i think you know someone <laughs> said we talked about that how like, you know, for example, in a recent podcast, a group discussion podcast, I we were talking about the storytelling. And I think it was Alexander Rossov that said, oh, you know, let's talk about the storytelling. What is the storytelling in video games? Just, for example, there's a soldier girl with, you know, a handgun with tape around it and a bunch of numbers around it. So it has some memento to it. And that's it. Like, that's a storytelling to make it unique and cool and stuff like that. And because it's like tropes like this, you know, similar tropes like this that in media and in games that you see, like, for example, I don't know, in... Um, 
like as you said, like like in even environment concept art or concept art, like a lot of things are getting too similar sometimes when you look at, for example, yeah. art station, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it's but of, at the same time, you know, it's just because there's so many people wanting to practice and put their portfolio for the same positions and everything like that. So it's a natural tendency for things to start looking similar. But at the same time, that's when, for example, someone who does something really like, you know, out of the box and freaky and weird, but at the same time, interesting is going to really stand out, you know? You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. And there's nothing wrong with like doing more generic stuff or oh, yeah. just like no, no, practicing no, your skills. I mean, it's, it's, but exactly like you said, like the more of yourself you put into the work and the more you really make it yours, um, the more it kind of stands out from all the noise out there. Um, yeah. And I think there's like a certain level of, um, like technical finish that you obviously have to hit to like get into the industry and start working professionally. But after that, like after you reach the quality, um, that's required, it becomes all about like just the ideas and like your take on things because like nobody's expecting you to come up with something a hundred percent original, but everyone has a different perspective and a different way of, uh, thinking about like ideas that have been, you know, presented since the dawn of time. I mean, all movies <laughs> kind of, I mean, they follow along the same things, you know, like same kind of story tropes, like you were saying, and, and same themes and they play with the same ideas, but the really good ones um, have a unique and kind of fresh way of um, interpreting that and, and kind of presenting that. Yeah, definitely. And um, there's, Another like topic I want to ask you about and talk to you about, which is like yeah. for example, we talked about personal work, right? Um, have you already like started a project for yourself and started like working on the you finished the reference board and the ideation phase and all that stuff and you progress it a little bit, do some sketches, but maybe something happens and you don't work for it for a while and you come back like a month or two months later, but then when you open the files and everything, you don't feel the same passion as you had. Like, how yeah. do you deal with this with this thing? Like, I don't know, it's a creative block or something, or maybe it's just a lot of reasons. But have you ever experienced this kind of similar, something similar to this? And how do you deal with this? Like, for example, not having the same passion as you had for your projects, or you realize, oh, why did I think of it? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I have experienced that. I think everyone has, um, and I think it can have to do with creative block, but it's also like you know, you come back to something after a while and maybe your taste has literally changed in that time, or maybe it just doesn't interest you anymore. Um, like if I look at a lot of work in my portfolio now and I go back, it's like a lot of the stuff is kind of, uh, (laughs) I don't like it. But, um, in, in like the situation you're talking about where like, say you take a break from something and then you come back to it and you're not feeling it anymore. In that situation, I never force myself to finish it. Um, and that's kind of how I handle that because it's, um, it's two things. Like you only have so much time, right. To work on personal work. So you might as well be doing something that you enjoy and that you're going to like, hopefully be proud of and want to share. Um, but also it kind of goes back to what I was talking about, about I'm, I like, I'm constantly trying to make sure I'm enjoying what I'm doing because as soon as like art becomes a job for me and it's not fun anymore, that like kills the whole thing. Right. So if, especially for something like personal work where I have no obligation to like finish it, if I don't want to, like, why would I force myself to one, not have fun and to work on something that doesn't interest me anymore when um like, there's no, there's nothing no penalty to just scrapping it and starting something new, you know? Um, so I think that's, that's usually how I deal with that specific issue. Um, and it's like, I think I would say just like, don't be afraid to just completely trash a project because there's no wasted time when it comes to like, Oh, I already spent 10 hours on this. I have to finish it or I wasted all that time. Cause like in those 10 hours, you still learn something. Um, you still improved your process or learned something about your taste or like how you like to design. Um, and so as long as you go into it with that kind of mindset and still take something away from it, it's, it's not like you're throwing, throwing time away. 
All right. And also, is it the same with Creative Black, by the way? You know, because like, like the uh, is the worst, honestly, like that's something I've been experiencing lately. Like, you know, whenever you start like sketching, like trying to think of ideas to make like projects and none of them, like at first you do something you like try to explore, but then nothing satisfies you at all. Like no matter what concept and you just don't find anything that you can't come up you can't like imagine like any concept that you have like as something cool and unique and start you know getting excited about, about it get that dopamine and trying to f- go after it mm-hmm. like how do you deal with that like have you experienced that like that sort of crazy block yeah <clears throat> yeah I, I i mean i kind of take a similar approach to that stuff it's um for one the the us- i guess the first way i usually try to break out of it is i look at things instead of trying to like force myself to come up with something and continue to draw or whatever, um, when it's just not working, I'll go to like Pinterest or like YouTube and just like watch something, um, and look at photos and see if anything inspires me. And a lot of the time that does, and you like, you'll find a specific photo that you kind of latch onto and that'll get ideas going and that it, it gets you back into kind of that creative flow. Um, but if I don't really break out of that, I usually will literally just take a step away and say, okay, I'm, I'm just going to not do art right now. I'm going to go for a walk or I'm going to, you know, like go hang out with my dog or play, maybe play a video game. I don't know. Just take a break. Um, because I think the big thing with creative block is you can kind of like get into a loop with yourself of like, you're doing all these sketches and you're coming up with these ideas and you hate all of them. And then you're thinking about how (laughs) I hate all these ideas. I can't come up with anything good. Like I'm wasting all this time. And then you just, you get into your head to a point where you're just not going to come up with anything good because you're just so in your own head and it's like, uh, like kind of like an anxiety thing. Um, and so at that point it's better to just cut your losses and like chill out and come back to it. Um, with a fresh yes, headspace where you, the you have to, challenge, you know, because when you want to take yeah. a break, you're always at the back of your head feel guilty and, you know, want to, no, 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 I need to be protected. Yeah. <laughs> and even when you're chilling, you're playing video games or just watching something on Netflix or, or just taking a walk outside or something to get yeah. fresher. You're like, no, no, I should go back and try to figure something out. I can't, I can't rest. Like it's in the yeah. back. Of it. It's that, uh, it's, it's really, it's one of the biggest things I've had to deal with in the past couple of years. Like I can't chill. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's really relatable. And I think everyone, every artist has experienced it. And like, that's exactly the kind of like toxic mental loop I'm talking about is like, you literally can't stop thinking about it. Right. It like, it's just in your head and you're in a bad headspace. And I think what it comes down to is realizing that to I'd be really creative and to come up with something that you're going to enjoy and something that um, you can get excited about, you can't be kind of in that like anxious headspace. Um, and I think once you realize that and just say like, right now I'm not going to come up with anything good. (laughs) I I just need to stop trying for this for the moment and like do whatever you got to do. And it's different for everyone. Like for me going on a walk does kind of clear my head, but if that doesn't work for you, then, you know, maybe, maybe the solution is something else. Um, but it's just, um, I think breaking that loop, is like a big thing, at least for me. And, you know, this is all just like my personal experience. I know everyone has kind of different ways of dealing with this stuff, but, um, for me, that's usually how I, how I deal with it. And I, there is a, a, a higher level of anxiety associated with it with students because, and I remember this from when I was studying too, because you don't have a job and you have to make good stuff to get a job. Right. So it's like, oh my God, I, I have like this creative block and I'm freaking out about it. And I just like, I can't get it out of my head and I can't come up with anything. And then it, you start going down the path of like, if I don't come up with anything, like I'm not going to get a job and I, you know, on and on and on. Um, so it's like a lot worse when you're a student because like, at least if you're a working professional, it's like, I'm just not going to do this personal work right now. And like, I still have my job in the morning and uh, <laughs> the stakes are, I guess, a little bit lower to constantly be, improving and producing work. Um, so I, I think it is, it is one of those things that just, I mean, it's like really hard and it's a struggle for everyone. And you, you kind of have to figure out for you, what is the best way to kind of clear your mind out of all that stuff so that you can get into a more creative headspace. Yep. 
I don't know. Does that does that resonate with you, or am I just oh, yes. sounding no, like I mean, a crazy it's, person? It's, 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 it's <laughs> sound, but you know, at the same time, it's like you know, everyone has. It's like, like easier oh, said than done, right? Exactly. Yeah. Like yeah, and for everyone, it's different. <laughs> for me, like listen, believe it or not, I'm not even exaggerating. I've been meaning to chill out for a while for two years mm-hmm. and actually rest, but that's been impossible. Now, here's the thing. Yeah. You might think that when I'm saying this, I've been super productive. Well, not exactly. It's when you can't actually chill and, you know, unwind, like the everything here, like, you know, it's you ruin you both your fun and productivity at the same time, you know? So yeah, that's something I <laughs> exactly. Actively, like, work on it, you know? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So, all right, sure. Even if, or so here's the thing. Both of the scenarios, I'm not being super productive, but I can be actually get calmer at one of them. No? Yeah. So that's the goal right now for me. And um, yeah. Yeah. Now, speaking of, you know, this stuff now, it's been like around an hour and five minutes, which actually we reached the final question on a section of the podcast, which is nice. called <laughs> Time Capsule. All right. So I don't know if you heard any of the previous episodes fully before, but, you know, I usually always ask this at the end of, you know, each episode. So basically, what it entails is like what I'm trying to ask you is right now is, like in the past 26 years of your life, you know, that you've lived, right? What are some of the most valuable life lessons and like an important life lessons you've learned along the way that you could tell us to anyone who's from one human being to another human being? And that another human being is, of course, anyone who's listening to this podcast at any point of time in the future. Like, yeah, if you want to reach down deep down to the core of your personal, like, you know, the person who you are right now, what are the most important things that you've learned? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so this is a hard one because it sounds like I, like, <laughs> I don't know that I'm qualified to give advice to people. <laughs> Honestly, um, I think even if I, as long as you can speak and express yourself, I think you can, we're qualified to tell anything. That's yeah. my, that's my genuine, like, uh, ideal yeah. way of thinking, you know? Yeah. That, I mean, that's a good mindset to have. I, I think for me, it would be, you know, um, it work really hard and, and go after your goals and your passions and like the dreams you have for yourself. But, um, don't, I guess, lose sight of what's like really important, which is like your physical health, your mental health, um, and all the other aspects of like, you know, family, friends, um, uh, social connection, that kind of stuff. Because I think, and this is something that's, I think related to a lot of artists and students that I've met is that, Um, and kind of going back to like what we were talking about with like, kind of like how you get in your head and it's kind of like this anxious loop, but, um, it's really easy to kind of like shut yourself away and just do like art all the time. And I mean, I did it for a while. A lot of people do it and it, you just sacrifice so much other stuff that it's, it's really not worth it. Cause the way I like to think about it is in like, in like 40 years, I'm like going to look back and be like, damn, I wish I had done, you know, another couple hours of art. And like, no, I'm going to wish I like, like had experiences or spent time with family, spent time with friends, you know, all these other things that are um, obviously, like, they're definitely more important, but it's really easy to lose sight of um, in the moment when you're like really chasing down your goals and, uh, and, and, you know, working really hard to achieve what you set out to do. And I think it's just something you got to remind yourself once in a while to, uh, you know, pay attention to the other stuff and <laughs> not kill yourself in the pursuit of whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, definitely. And, um, well, I think that's a wrap. Thank you so much for taking your time out of your schedule. And right now, I think it's, uh, 11 is 12 PM right now where you are, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, so sir. thank you for taking the time out of your schedule yeah. for this episode. And thank you no to worries, everyone who need to listen and watch this episode on YouTube. I hope you enjoyed it. If, as always, if there's any comments or suggestions or anything, leave them down in the comment section down below. And um, with that being said, we're nearly getting to the end of the episode 300. So that's going to be really exciting. And I'm, and the past couple of like, you know, and by past couple, I mean actually the past 20 episodes that I've been recording in the past like month or two. I've been keep discussing about the next color palette of the next season of the podcast. So I don't know, I'm either going to go with red or orange. So these two are the big contenders. Um, so yeah, first season was green. The second season was blue. The third season right now is yellow. 
No, I don't know. Maybe it's, it's probably red, to be honest, for the next color palette. Um, but yeah, with that being said, take care, everyone. Stay safe. Till next episode. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me, man.